before we begin, I just want to remind you that Somewhere Sinister is back up and running. We're getting through Season 4 and already starting to work on Season 5, so if you like this show, you'll probably like that one. So check it out. A link is in the description. In June of 2015, the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Chester, England saw a sharp rise in the mortality rate of their unit. Like other hospitals in the area, it was normal to see three or four deaths occur in the unit in a year. Unfortunately, there were three deaths in June alone, and that increase in fatalities wouldn't slow down over the next year. Despite the hospital trying to shrug it off as medication errors or even just coincidence, it wouldn't be long before the staff realized that someone was intentionally killing the babies. This is Monsters. Lucy Letby was born on January 4, 1990 to John and Susan Letby in Hereford, England. She was an only child. Lucy was described as a kind and happy child who did well at school and regularly attended church. Susan was said to have had a difficult birth with Lucy and a friend said that it affected the girl throughout her life. As far as anybody could remember, Lucy had always wanted to become a nurse and she took her studies seriously so that she could make that dream come true. Being an only child and having come from a difficult birth, it wasn't surprising that people described Lucy as having been spoiled. She was doted on by her parents and it seemed as if they never really told her no. Even as an adult, she would go on multiple vacations a year at her parents' expense and they even helped her buy a house. Throughout her life, Lucy became accustomed to getting anything she wanted. After high school, Lucy attended the University of Chester where she graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Child Nursing in 2011. During her three years at university, she worked as a student nurse at both Liverpool Women's Hospital and the Countess of Chester Hospital. After qualifying as a Band 5 nurse, which is the level of a nurse just starting out in the field, Lucy continued to work at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Over the years, she worked with various children at the hospital, but in 2015, she qualified to work with infants in the intensive care unit. She was soon transferred to the neonatal intensive care unit, sometimes referred to as the NICU. The hospital's neonatal unit is where ill or premature newborn infants are treated. The word neonatal refers to the first 28 days of life after birth. It was exactly where Lucy always dreamed of working as a nurse, taking care of babies who had been born and suffered some sort of complications. In 2013, Lucy was interviewed by the Chester Standard when the hospital was holding a fundraiser and she told the reporter that her role at the hospital involved, quote, caring for a wide range of babies requiring various levels of support. Lucy told other people that she thought non-intensive care work was boring. By that time in Lucy's life, she seemed to be in a good place. She was working her dream job helping babies who had a hard start at life. She was active with friends, going out to eat and taking dance lessons. The hospital had accommodations for the staff and Lucy stayed there for a little while before getting her own apartment in Chester. At some point after that, she purchased a house. When Lucy began working in the neonatal unit, the death rate for the infants that were admitted was the same as any other hospital in the country. Without any outside interference, death rates should generally match throughout the area. Within a year of Lucy starting work in the neonatal unit, the mortality rate in that unit of Countess of Chester Hospital increased significantly. Research showed that it was 10% higher than other neonatal units. The neonatal unit at Countess of Chester Hospital usually had two to three deaths per year, but in June of 2015, there were three deaths in just that month alone. The infants that would become the victims of this case all have their identities protected, so they're referred to by letters. Lucy's first victim was Baby A. At the end of May 2015, Lucy completed a training course to be qualified to inject patients. That training course had a section about the dangers of injecting air into the bloodstream. 
An air embolism occurs when air manages to get into the bloodstream. It can happen in the event that air gets into an open wound, but it's much more common to be the result of surgery or injection. If the air bubble is large enough, it can travel to the heart, lungs, or brain and cause major damage or death. Baby A was a twin boy who was born premature on June 8, 2015. Though he wasn't considered to be in much danger, he was admitted to the neonatal unit for observation. Lucy was working the night shift and was assigned to care for Baby A that evening. Ninety minutes after she started her shift, Baby A was dead. It's believed that Lucy injected air into the infant, causing his death. She alerted the doctor on staff and after trying to resuscitate the baby, he was pronounced dead. There was no reason to suspect Lucy had done anything to harm the child as it was early in her time at the neonatal unit and deaths did occur. She was ultimately praised for how she handled the situation. Baby B was actually Baby A's twin sister and Lucy attempted to kill her just over a day later. It's believed that she also injected air into Baby B, but the infant's distress was noticed early and she was successfully resuscitated. In an intensive care unit, complications that are successfully resolved and don't result in death are more common. So this incident wasn't suspicious and Lucy continued to fly under the radar. Baby C was a boy who had been born 10 weeks early and had been in the neonatal unit for a little while. Doctors noted that he was doing well, he was growing well and seemed on track to eventually make it home to his parents. On June 14th, Lucy was on shift though she wasn't assigned to care for Baby C. It's believed that, while his nurse was busy with another task, Lucy injected air into the infant's nasogastric tube, causing his death. The doctor would initially determine that Baby C died from, quote, widespread hypoxic ischemic damage to the heart myocardium due to lung disease. Again, there was no reason to think someone had intentionally done anything to harm the infants in the unit, so the doctor used their medical histories to determine the most likely cause of death. Baby D was a girl who had been born premature and with a suspected infection. It wasn't anything serious, but she was admitted to the neonatal unit just in case. Again, during Lucy's shift, she injected air into the infant and she crashed multiple times. She was able to be resuscitated twice, but the third time she died. Now there had been as many deaths in the month of June as there normally would be in an entire year and the hospital management was concerned. There was possibly something happening at the hospital that was causing the deaths and so an informal review was done by Dr. Stephen Breary, a lead neonatologist. He found that Lucy had been the only nurse who had been on shift during every death. He submitted his findings to the NHS Foundation Trust, but they determined that the deaths were either natural or medication errors. The fact that all three of the deaths happened at times when Lucy was on shift was chalked up to coincidence. The hospital was short-staffed and Lucy had been picking up a lot of extra shifts, so it seemed more likely that she would be around. From that point, no further investigation was ordered and Lucy was allowed to remain in the neonatal unit. Babies E and F were identical twin boys who had been born premature in early August. On the 4th, their mother heard one of them screaming and came into the neonatal unit where she saw Lucy standing over baby E. Like most reasonable people, she assumed that Lucy was helping care for the infant, which was her job. In reality, Lucy had injected air into the baby's nasogastric tube, which had caused blood to come out of his mouth. When the mother asked about the blood, Lucy told her that it was due to the feeding tube. A later review of Lucy's notes showed no mention of blood. Later, the baby crashed and was unable to be resuscitated. The following day, his brother, Baby F, also crashed but was able to be resuscitated. It was determined that someone had injected insulin into his IV bag. No other patient in the neonatal unit was prescribed insulin, so it was unlikely it was a medication mix-up. In September, Lucy made multiple attempts to kill Baby G, a girl born prematurely. On the 7th, she overfed her, which caused her to vomit, but she recovered. Then on the 21st, she overfed her and injected air into her. The infant stopped breathing but was able to be resuscitated. She was left permanently disabled due to the trauma of what Lucy Letby had done to her. Lucy also made multiple attempts to kill her next victim, Baby I, a girl born at 27 weeks. Her parents would see her make incredible progress before being transferred to Countess of Chester Hospital. 
Lucy started on September 30th by injecting air into the infant's feeding tube, but the baby girl survived. She made two more attempts before October 23rd when she succeeded in her mission. I skipped over Baby H, who Lucy was accused of attempting to kill, but she was found not guilty at trial. The same would happen for attempted murder charges for babies J and K. There were too many other factors that made it impossible to say what had actually happened to the babies. The extraordinary amount of infant deaths happening at Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal unit had caused much concern for Dr. Breary, and it was still noticeable that the deaths only started happening after Lucy began working in the unit, and that they were only happening while she was working. Those weren't the only red flags that should have been noticed during that time, though. Lucy was using the deaths to soak up attention, and it wasn't subtle. After the death of Baby A, Lucy exchanged texts between co-workers saying, quote, It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Just a big shock for us. Hard coming in tonight and seeing the parents. Of course, after only one death, this text seemed innocent enough, but it would become the start of a long campaign of attention that Lucy would always look for surrounding the death she caused. Just hours after the death of Baby C, it was revealed that Lucy had looked up the infant's parents on Facebook. Then she texted her colleagues, quote, It's all a bit much. After she received the sympathy she was looking for, she responded, quote, It's not about me. We learn to deal with it. After baby D died, she also looked up her parents on Facebook and texted co-workers to say she hadn't been able to stop crying, though people around her said she never looked upset. After baby E died and she attempted to kill baby F, she texted colleagues, quote, I said goodbye to Baby F's parents as she might go tomorrow. They both cried and hugged me, saying they will never be able to thank me for the love and care I gave to Baby F and for the precious memories I've given them. At that point, Lucy had become a full attention addict. She was causing deaths in order to soak in sympathy and look like some sort of hero. The hospital ordered another review which was carried out by Dr. Namish Subhadar. That review found that the rate of deaths in the neonatal unit was highly unusual and it noted that the incidents only happened on the night shifts when Lucy was scheduled to work. That review didn't seem to raise alarm bells with hospital management, even after another doctor raised concerns about Lucy in February of 2016. He had seen Lucy, who was not assigned to care for the child, standing over baby K, a girl born premature, and watched as the infant's O2 levels dropped, but Lucy didn't call for help. And watched as the infant's O2 levels dropped, but Lucy didn't call for help. When he checked on baby K, he found her breathing tube dislodged and the alarm system set on pause. She died three days later. Unfortunately, the doctor's concerns were ignored, and he was even told to keep quiet. At the same time, Dr. Breary had sent another review to hospital's medical director, Ian Harvey. He showed that the only person on shift during every death was Lucy Letby, and he wanted to meet with hospital management to discuss the situation. Nobody was willing to meet with him. This is when the hospital starts becoming liable for these infant deaths. It seems that in every case of a medical professional killing patients, the hospital's first priority is to protect their reputation, instead of protecting their patients. They end up allowing the murderer to continue injuring and murdering patients because they're afraid of what it will look like in the media. Obviously, a thorough investigation needs to be conducted to ensure the person in question is really causing harm before further action is taken. But by this time, there should have been more than enough suspicion to remove Lucy from working directly with patients while they investigate. So, in 2016, Lucy was allowed to continue working and taking the lives of premature infants. On April 9th, Lucy attempted to kill twin boys who were in the neonatal unit. She injected insulin into Baby L's IV bag and injected air into Baby M. Both boys survived, but Baby M was left with permanent brain damage. It was before these deaths that Lucy was moved from the night shift to the day shift. From that point on, the deaths in the neonatal unit on the night shift stopped. In April, Dr. Breary finally met with the management of the hospital, but they brushed his concerns off, claiming there was no evidence that Lucy was harming infants and that it was just a coincidence. Pretty big coincidence at this point. 
Not long after that meeting, Lucy went on vacation to Ibiza, an island off the coast of Spain. She spent seven days on the island with friends, drinking and dancing, before returning to the hospital on June 23rd. You may not be surprised to hear that there were no incidents in the neonatal unit while she was on vacation. The same day she returned to work, however, she killed two of three triplet boys that had been born premature a few days prior. She injected air into baby O, and soon after, the infant crashed and died. Just 13 minutes later, Lucy was recorded feeding baby P, and just after, he too crashed and died. The following day, Lucy made her last attempt to kill an infant in her unit. She injected air into baby Q, but the child fortunately survived. Lucy would be found not guilty of that charge of attempted murder. It had been almost a year since the first of many alarms about Lucy Letby had been raised and the hospital was still resisting to do anything about the situation. The connection by that point was too strong, though, and the management was forced to take action in the investigation into Lucy's involvement. She worked three more shifts before being placed on clerical duty. From that day on, the death rate in the neonatal unit at Countess of Chester Hospital dropped back to normal level. The hospital management learned the hard way that Lucy being the only person on shift during every death was not a coincidence. They gambled with the lives of the most vulnerable among us and lost. Despite it being clear that Lucy was involved, they still chose not to involve the police. They had a review conducted by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health and scaled back their operation, not admitting any infants who were born more than eight weeks premature. When that review was complete, it said that they couldn't find a definitive explanation for the increase in mortality rate at the unit, but did say there was some insufficient staffing. How could that be, you might ask? Well, they completely excluded Lucy from their investigation. So, they conducted a review where they ignored the cause of the increased mortality rate and, unsurprisingly, couldn't figure out why there was an increased mortality rate. Fucking brilliant. Then, in September, Lucy filed a grievance with the hospital about being taken off clinical duty and the management immediately took her side. They said she had been moved to clerical duties with no evidence and pushed to have her moved back to the neonatal unit. These people were so dead set on not admitting infants had been murdered in their hospital that they were trying to put the murderer back in contact with victims. By that time, doctors at the hospital had researched air embolism deaths and found that they matched most of the fatalities that had happened under Lucy's care. They also noted that, while most of the nursing staff was having a very hard time dealing with the string of deaths over the prior year, Lucy didn't seem to have a care in the world. By the beginning of 2017, the hospital was trying to get Lucy back into the neonatal unit, even offering to transfer her to a different hospital. They had even forced the doctors who had made accusations against Lucy write apology letters. Those doctors complied, but they knew they weren't wrong. About a week before Lucy would have returned to clinical duty, the police were finally called and an official investigation began. In March of 2017, Operation Hummingbird started. Detective Inspector Paul Hughes of the Cheshire Police was put in charge of the investigation and Lucy was not allowed to return to work in the interim. Over the course of the following year, the police investigated each death individually, which was done by giving each case to a separate investigator and having them look into the death on their own. That way, they weren't influenced by other cases. Then the lead could review all of the cases and see if any patterns emerged. They worked with Dr. Dewey Evan, a retired pediatrician, to review the medical records and he determined that 15 of the cases, including deaths and crashes, could not be explained medically. Over the course of the investigation, the cause for the rise in mortality in the neonatal unit was whittled down to only one possibility. Someone was deliberately harming the infants. When that was determined, the hospital staff was investigated and the only person who had access to every victim during the attacks was Lucy Letby. On top of that, the spike in deaths had immediately stopped once Lucy was taken off of clinical duty. It had been nine months before the police investigation began and that lasted another year and the mortality rate had remained at the normal level of two to three deaths a year. Dr. Evan also noted that the information regarding the cases was more than enough for the hospital management to have made the same determination. 
He believed there was evidence that not only the hospital ignored concerns about Lucy, they also actively covered them up. At that point, the police had to notify the parents of the victims that they were conducting a murder investigation. So those poor parents had to deal with the loss of their child, thinking that they had died from medical complications. And as unfortunate as that would be, it's still considered natural causes which could be easier to cope with. Then they had to learn that someone had actually murdered or attempted to murder their children. The person who was supposed to be caring for their infant had actually ended their life. These parents might have hugged and thanked Lucy for her work when they left the hospital, not knowing that she was actually their child's murderer. When Lucy's house was searched, investigators found a diary and inside was a post-it note covered in writing. Within the text was written, quote, I am evil, I did this. It also said, quote, I don't deserve to live. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough to take care of them. I am a horrible, evil person. On a different piece of paper inside her diary, she had written, quote, I killed them. I don't know if I killed them. Maybe I did. Maybe this is down to me. Other notes found in her home had words professing her love for a colleague and another that had the words, quote, Help me, I can't do this anymore, and... How can life be this way written on them? Various medical paperwork with confidential patient information was found in the house. When she was asked why she had it, she said she'd forgotten it in her pocket when she left work and didn't have a shredder at home. Then the investigators found a shredder in her home. And it wasn't like a couple of papers that would seem reasonable to forget about. There were 247 documents. When Lucy was questioned, police noted that she showed absolutely no emotion. They asked her about every case individually, and she denied harming any of the infants. They pointed out that baby C's alarm went off, and the assigned nurse walked into the nursery and found Lucy standing over the baby. That was nursery one, but Lucy was assigned to nursery three, and she would have had no reason to even be in there. When they asked her why she was in nursery one, she said she couldn't remember. She was asked why she had searched for the baby's families on Facebooks for months after their deaths, including birthdays and Christmas. Lucy said she just wanted to know how they were doing. Another family, she said she didn't remember looking up on Facebook. It's suspected that she looked at the Facebook pages on birthdays and holidays because those would likely include posts about the loss, and Lucy enjoyed knowing that she had affected their lives. Ultimately, Lucy claimed she had no involvement in the deaths or crashes and it had all been bad luck. I'm sorry, but nobody has bad luck like that. Sure, there are people who go through periods where a number of bad things happen all at once, but those are generally short-lived and involve different bad things each happening once, which gives them a higher likelihood of happening. The probability that the exact same thing, being a premature infant dying in the neonatal unit, constantly happening around you at an astronomical rate over the course of a year, when that event normally has a low statistical likelihood is simply not a thing. And the deaths followed her from night shift to day shift. Nobody is that unlucky and coincidences of that magnitude do not happen. Lucy was arrested three times over the years before her trial. She was first arrested at 6 a.m. on July 3, 2018 at her home in Chester. That was the same time her house was searched. Lucy would go on to complain that she was dragged out of her house in her pajamas, but photos of the interaction clearly show her being led away from the home wearing blue track pants and a sweatshirt. It was just another little attempt for Lucy to get sympathy and attention. Lucy was eventually released so investigators could gather more evidence. Lucy was rearrested on June 10, 2019 at her parents' home in Hereford. She was questioned again and then released on bail. She was then arrested the third time on November 10, 2020 and her bail was revoked. She was charged with the murder of seven babies and with 15 counts of the attempted murder of 10 other babies. Her trial began at Manchester Crown Court on October 10, 2022. The case was prosecuted by Nicholas Johnson. In his opening statement, he outlined the deaths and attempted murders that Lucy had been charged with. He described the security in the neonatal unit, making it hard for anyone other than staff to be there. He detailed how Lucy was the only staff member to be on shift for every single attack, and even how the incidents moved with her from night shift to day shift. 
then how they all stopped when she was taken off clinical duty. The defense gave an opening statement that could basically be summed up with the shrug emoji. He wanted to make it clear that there was no direct evidence proving that Lucy committed any crimes and wanted the court to believe that she was just the unluckiest person in the world. Witnesses testified about catching Lucy in the act, the mother of baby G who had walked in on Lucy while she was attempting to kill the infant, the nurse who was assigned to baby C who had walked in on Lucy in nursery one, a doctor who walked into a nursery and saw Lucy standing over a baby who was crashing, but didn't start intervening until she noticed him walk in. It was clear that it wasn't only her schedule that made her guilty, but people had seen her in the act. They just hadn't realized that's what was happening, because who sees a pediatric nurse near a baby and immediately thinks, she's trying to murder the baby? Nobody. It's only in hindsight, with more information, that that picture and her intentions at the time become clear. Then there was the doctor who heard Lucy say that baby P was, quote, not getting out of here alive. The doctor on shift thought it was a weird statement since the infant had a favorable prognosis, but sure enough, it wasn't long before the baby crashed and died. It had turned out that Lucy had made a similar comment about baby C almost a year earlier. The parents of baby L and M said that they were interacting with Lucy in the nursery and she was very relaxed. Then baby M crashed and was successfully resuscitated, at which point Lucy's mood changed. The parents said she suddenly seemed very annoyed by them. It was also discovered that Lucy had falsified documents to try to cover some of her tracks. After a review of paperwork she had completed during her shifts, it was found that she had changed the times that some of the babies crashed and had omitted details, even though other staff had witnessed those details happen. When Lucy took the stand to testify in her own defense, she repeated her denial of being involved in any harm to any babies in the neonatal unit. It was noticed that she cried when she talked about what she had personally lost, but she immediately stopped crying once she started talking about the dead infants. She claimed that the increase of deaths in the unit was due to other staff, from failed hospital policy and lack of proper equipment. Throughout her testimony, it was reported that she contradicted herself a number of times and her story became muddled. On August 18th, 2023, the jury found Lucy Lepi guilty of seven counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder. She was found not guilty on two counts of attempted murder and the jury wasn't able to reach a verdict on six of the attempted murder charges. On August 21st, Lucy was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order. Unfortunately, Lucy chose not to attend the sentencing, so she wasn't there to hear the impact statements from the parents whose lives she had destroyed. The parents of babies A and B told the court about the loss of one child and almost both. They said, quote, Never could we have imagined that the most precious thing in our lives would have been placed in harm's way and in the care of a nurse who was capable of such despicable actions. We never got to hold our little boy while he was still alive because you took him away. The parents of Baby D made sure that Lucy knew that she would never be forgiven, saying, quote, Those lives were not yours to take, and although I am torn with sadness, anger, and unanswered questions, I could not forgive you. There is no forgiving, not now, not ever. The mother of Baby's E and F said, Our boys were extraordinary miracles. We had experienced failed IVF attempts with the conclusion that I would never be able to conceive. Then, out of the blue, we discovered we were expecting twins. That feeling remains one of the happiest times in my life. I felt like I was walking on a cloud, pure happiness. And that's what confuses me the most. Lucy was aware of our journey and deliberately caused significant harm and cruelty to our boys. No children in this world were more wanted and loved than them. No child deserves what happened in this case, but I still struggle to understand why it happened to us. Lucy presented herself as kind, caring, and soft-spoken. Now I know it was all an act, a sadistic abuse of power that has left me unable to trust anyone. Lucy Letby's acts had rippled out and affected entire families, people that would never be able to overcome the sheer evil that she had inflicted upon them. And despite her being able to escape the statements of those people, she was going to spend the rest of her life in prison because of those acts. The prosecutor had 28 days to decide if he was going to retry Lucy for any of the charges that the jury wasn't able to reach a verdict on. 
He announced that they would be retrying Lucy on one of the charges, but the trial wouldn't be scheduled until after Lucy received a decision on whether or not she would be able to appeal her current conviction. Lucy requested permission for appeal on January 24th, and in May, the Court of Appeals denied her request. The retrial for one count of attempted murder started on June 10th, 2024. Possible motives as to why Lucy committed the crime she did have been speculated with theories including that she became addicted to the attention, that she wanted to play God, or that she was simply thrill-seeking. People said that Lucy was a fairly basic person who didn't really stand out and maybe she had some sort of internal struggle with that. We may never know the truth as Lucy refuses to admit her guilt, and she likely never will. People like Lucy believe they can fool people if they just hold on to the lie long enough. And to a degree, it's worked. There are many people who are close to Lucy who still believe in her innocence. Many online sleuths have come up with so-called evidence that Lucy was not guilty, though it's less evidence and more, well, maybe. People say that the hospital was understaffed and that caused the quality of care to decline. Of course, lower quality of care would absolutely cause the mortality rate to increase. But why didn't it increase for everyone? Not only other nurses on other shifts, but other units in the hospital. A decline in the quality of care would be an overall issue that would affect the hospital overall. The mortality rate of the hospital overall should increase. But let's play devil's advocate and say it was just the quality of care in the neonatal unit that had gone down. Why didn't the mortality rate on the day shift increase when Lucy was still on the night shift? And why did the night shift suddenly stop being affected by that lower quality of care when Lucy switched to day shift? There's no reasonable way to explain why the deaths specifically followed Lucy around without accepting that she was the one causing them. And none of that adds in that she was seen directly interacting with multiple babies that then crashed and died. It's unfortunate for her supporters, but it's clear that something broke inside of her and she decided to start murdering infants in the neonatal unit. Due to the fear that Lucy may have harmed other infants, police investigated her employment at the other hospital where she had worked while still in nursing school. Around 4,000 cases of deaths at Liverpool's Women's Hospital, where Lucy worked from 2012 to 2015, were investigated by the hospital and any that turned up as being suspicious were turned over to the police. It's possible that further charges against Lucy could be brought if any more cases turn up. The Cheshire Constabulary also announced that they were opening an investigation into corporate manslaughter at the Countess of Chester Hospital. They said, quote, The investigation will focus on the indictment period of the charges for Lucy Letby from June 2015 to June 2016, and consider areas including senior leadership and decision-making to determine whether any criminality has taken place. At this stage, we are not investigating any individuals in relation to gross negligence manslaughter. Those actions stem from the fact that hospital management was notified multiple times of concerns surrounding Lucy's involvement with the increased mortality rate in the neonatal unit. If it's found that more swift intervention could have saved some of the lives in the case, the hospital could be held criminally liable. This is not the first time that a hospital would knowingly allow a staff member to continue working or work somewhere else despite knowledge that they were harming patients. I've already covered Charles Cullen and Janine Jones, who both worked long after suspicions were raised about them. Hospital management is more concerned about maintaining a good reputation and are willing to risk patients' lives in order to accomplish that. On August 21, 2023, the nursing director at Countess of Chester Hospital was suspended and the Nursing and Midwifery Council began an investigation to determine her fitness to practice. Lucy Letby preyed on the absolute most vulnerable among us. Not only newborn infants, but babies that were already struggling. It's unknown why she did it, but whatever her reason, she needed to take those lives and inflict unimaginable pain and suffering on their families. There is no way that anyone can do that and not be a monster.
If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.